I get around to lots of churches, and this one is the most organized that I've ever been invited to. Because uh, the emails to, to get ready don't usually come. And I got sent emails 10 days ago or so. And uh, usually, I, to tell you the truth, I come to an Adventist church kind of in the dark. No one tells me what's, what I'm really going to do, and they don't ask me, and so that's the way it works. It's kind of like going to school, you know? <laughs> Teacher doesn't tell you enough, and then, no, I'm just kidding. But you guys deserve a lot of credit. Uh, came in, and she, she told me right where the sound person would be. I knew him from way back, way back in the day. So uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here. I want to talk to you a little bit today about mentoring how it occurred in Jesus' time, and some lessons we can draw from that. You know that uh, passage that you've quoted many times, where two or three are gathered in my name, what? All right, there I am among them. That is actually uh, a scripture about discipling and mentoring. Sometimes we think he's just, he's just there, but he's not just there. That was what happened with disciples in the time of Jesus the, G, uh, the, the, the leader, in this case Jesus, would choose who that he wants to call. And he would call some young men who wouldn't just go to school or learn ideas from Jesus, but they would actually live with the man who was the mentor. So um, they would get ready. They would wake up in the morning, see how does a prophet, how does a teacher get ready. Uh, they would learn how a teacher talks to people, how, you know, it would be like, Elijah, like having to live with me. I mean, can you imagine that? He tries not to. <laughs> All right. Well, I know DJ liked that because he was asking for a resume, uh, for, an, for a reference uh, a couple of weeks ago. So he'd, he'd kiss it up just long enough to do that. But it was Jesus was saying that where two or three are gathered in my name, they're my disciples. I'm, I'm, I have to be there because my intent is to, to help them just the way they are because I called them and I'm not going to let them down. So wherever they're gathered in my name, wherever they're my disciples to, to learn how I do things, I'm there because you can't teach somebody how to do something if you don't show up. And that's the full intent of that scripture. He says, if I call you, I, I'm going to be there. I'm no slouch. I'm going to be there right with them. And so it's more than, well, we're really in need. I know he's going to be here with us. Hope the Holy Spirit's hovering around. No, GC says, the reason you're here is because of me. I'm going to be there. It's a huge promise, and I want you to think about that when you think about mentoring today. It's, it's built out of relationships where we spend time doing things together. Now, in this scripture, Jesus is in trouble. They're upset with him because he healed a man on the Sabbath. and You shouldn't work on Sabbath. So they think that healing somebody is work. And he says, how do you think that I learned to do this? Here we go. Where do you think I got the idea to do this? From his mentor. He said, a man can only do what he sees his father doing. Now let me just go down deep in that, because you probably never really thought of in that society what it meant. They didn't have to go to the university to be ready for their career. You have a baby. If it's a daughter, she watches the mother take care of the house. She, she babysits the new babies that are coming. She helps cook. By the time she's 12 years old, she's ready to get married. 12, 13, 14 was the marriage age for girls because they had already learned everything from their mother that they had to learn. If you got to be 18 to 20 years old, a young woman, and you weren't married, they said, she's an old maid. She's an, she's an, I'm not kidding. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, was probably 12, 13, 14 years old. Wow, is right. But how about the son? As soon as he is done, he's weaned, he's ready to go off with his father. Now imagine where you guys work, you know, having your kid three years, four years, five years old tagging along. But it was the norm back then. What was uh, the career of Jesus' father? Okay, now you said carpenter. That's the traditional way. But the, actually the Greek word for, for them is a tecton. It, it, it means that they were 
technology driven. They were, this tectone word was the word not for little uh, Geppetto making Pinocchio in the shop. He's not that kind of, kind of carpenter. This tectone word means that he could throw up a bridge or a house. He, you need something built, call Jesus, call Joseph, okay? That's what a tectone was. That would mean he also had to negotiate prices. This is part of what Jesus learned. So a little boy would go, and probably the first day at work, he wouldn't, he'd get bored, and he'd have some pieces there on the ground, and he'd say, hey, you want to nail some wood? Take this hammer and just beat on the wood for a while, you know? And then after a while, he says, hey, you want me to show you how to swing that hammer with power? And so he goes down to, to Jesus, and he puts his hand over his, and he says, well, let me just take the hammer a second and, and watch how I, you know, and so he shows him how. He says, now you do it. Boom, boom, Jesus learns how to hammer. Then he tries a nail. And little by little, Joseph lets him go. And when the kid uh, wants to try the saw, he says, well, I'll show you how to do the saw. And so he, he shows him first, and then he holds his hand, and, and he says, it's this way. You get the power here, and not that way, you, you know. So he's just, Jesus is having fun, and every so often, Joseph breaks in when he can, and he shows him how. How do you think I learned to do this? So every father knew that his son who came to work with him can only do what he sees his father doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But Jesus is spending time with another father. You want some proof? When he got lost about age 12, which is the age that sons could get into business, he goes with his parents to Jerusalem, and he gets lost for a couple of days. And he says, didn't you know? I mean, this is the way it is. A 12-year-old needs to be about his father's business. So it's not like he was being a smarty. He's saying, well, this is the way it is. I'm 12. I'm ready to go. I must be about my father's business. But it's not just Joseph. Although um, he did work in that, that uh, tectone, work, tectone work for a while. Uh, he wanted to be about his father's business by the time he was 12. And then when he left on his ministry, he was still working there. I've often thought, kind of off the subject, just my, my thinking, um, if one of his brothers maybe took over the business. When, when Jesus walked out of the shop, says, I'm not building bridges anymore, I'm not going to build any more houses, I'm through with that, that fence is going to have to be fixed by somebody else. When he went off on his heavenly father's business, what happened? So you can just think about that. I don't know, and uh, maybe you'll have an insight that will get me to heaven, and that's fine. So what we see is that when Jesus gets in trouble with the mobs, like our scripture reading this morning, and they say, what do you think you're doing? The key answer is, very truly I tell you, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying to you, very truly I tell you, the son can't do anything by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. So when you're four, five, six years old and you learn that's the way to saw, that's the way you'll saw all your life. Because dad taught you. And Jesus says in his ministry, I heal people on the Sabbath because of all days. The Sabbath is a day for resting, refreshment, and, you know, being normal again. Getting restored. Every Sabbath we get restored. This is the day for healing. And listen, I wouldn't do this unless my father had taught me how to do it. Does that give you a little insight into how much of what we heard from Jesus is a story about teaching? It's watching your mentor. I should have asked these three that came up here, how much of watching me did you learn? Probably zero, right? Don't laugh, okay? But they, did you notice that they all had a mentor who had kind of brought them along? Moses Guerrero leads Estevan. Since he's a freshman, he's been talking to him. Gets to the mission trip. Hey, don't you think you, you want to be baptized? God spoke to Estevan, and up he popped. Um, Alyssa, kind of wandering. Mr. Hicks grabs her. And I mean, this story is very dramatic. She could have told a lot more, but he says, you come with me. I'm going to teach you how to study. I'm going to teach you how to, you know, I'm going to teach you how to have discipline. And I'm going to teach you how to love yourself, that your that you're being pretty won't be your only card that you play. Okay? And he really did, and she Told, I'm, I'm not telling anything out of school. Well, I guess it was Mountain View, but at Mountain View, when she gave her testimony, that's what she said. Not in those words, but I was, you know, 
the attention from the boys, I thought that was enough to get me through. And then I found out that attention from the boys only made me think less of myself. So Mr. Hicks just started, I mean, every day, go to, come to my office, he'd prime her. He'd, sometimes she'd be late to class. Mr. Hicks would walk her to the door. I'm sorry, she's with me. You know, but she began to know her stuff. She started to know how to study. Who am I? What am I going to do? It's dramatic. Just sees what their teacher's doing. Let me tell you one more scripture that I think relates to this. It's a very famous scripture uh, to Adventists. Uh, let's see, what time is it getting to be? What? No, no, what time is it? Okay, I'll get you out by 12, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an insight into this scripture, the last scripture. Uh, do you have your Bibles? Okay, open your Bibles up. I'm going to give you that. Well, I hadn't planned to do this. It's going to take about two to three minutes, and I'll still get you out at 12. I'll be done. I'll be done at 12. You know, you know, I can't. You can't even have students sit for 40, period, 40 minutes in a class these days. You try to, you try to give them so many, and uh, then you say, okay, you can take your phones out now. They're pretty much tied to their phones. Last Sabbath, Carlene and I went walking, and we went here and there, and she started keeping track of everybody who had a phone as they walked. We walked uh, along uh, in, in, in Los Gatos along the trail, Seven out of eight people had a phone that they were reading as they walked, even in a group. So we can't blame the kids, all right? But when they come to class, I usually give them two, three minutes, just, you know, just do your thing. And then I say, you got about 30 seconds, wrap it up. You know. And then we, I say, okay, you guys plug in for 25 minutes or 20 minutes and learn this, and then you're free. Can you do that? Yeah. So that's the way we work. You ready? Come to Matthew uh, 11, 28. It's right here on the board, but you need to have your Bible open to get the full power of this. No extra charge for this. All right? What's the last verse in Matthew 11? Is it 30? All right. We're going to look at 28 to 30 for a scripture. Where does this section begin and end? Take about 15 seconds, and when does this section begin and end? Here's a hint. If, it's, if you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to wonder, what is that therefore, therefore? Okay, why is it there? It's the end of something. Mm -hmm. If it says one day, it's the beginning of something, or it might say once. If it is, um, if it's then, you know that what happened leads to the next thing. Well, now you see Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, and there's a big white space, and then chapter 12. All right, why is the white space there? Any idea why the white space there is there? In your Bible, why does it go from 11 to 12, but there's a white space in between? It's an easy question. If I'm, if I'm a, I've never studied the Bible before, and I say to you, why is that white space there? It's to separate it. Do you know when that separation was put there? It was put about put there about a thousand years after this was written. It used to be all the same thread. Now I'll prove it to you. Come to me, I will give you what? Rest. How does chapter one start? Of, Chapter 12, how does verse 1 start of chapter 12? Oh, Sabbath day. What does the word Sabbath mean? Rest. So Jesus is telling them, the guy that put the paragraph, put the, the chapter division there, didn't understand what was going on. Jesus says, come to me, you're labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And then Jesus was in the grain field on the Sabbath and got in a fight with these guys about how to rest. So you see, this, the, the, the Sabbath story in 12 is connected to how it, chapter 11 ends. That, that should never have been there. Can I tell you one more off the subject, but one more example of this? It'll take me till 12.01, and you get, out, you get out a minute late. All right. If you're an Adventist, you've heard John 14, 1 to 3. And it starts out, if you want to go there, you can go. This is a free lesson. Okay, we'll come back to Matthew 11, but just take a look at John 14. 
John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Okay. Adventists know that because it's about the second coming. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe in me too. In my Father's house are many what? Well, actually, the King James Bible says mansions because it was a long time ago. But the word really means rooms. In my Father's house are many rooms. This summer we went to England, and uh, we saw uh, several of the palaces. So we went to Buckingham Palace, and there was another palace nearby. And then there was, uh, uh, where do they live? About 50 miles north or 50 miles west. Uh, main place the queen lives. Where is that? Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle. And then we went to Henry's Castle. So here were all these castles. Do you know what they all have in common? Lots of rooms. Okay? And what, what they did, what Henry did, and what um, the, the king of France, Louis XIV, did was they built an enormous, they built enormous mansions. Henry actually got his from, from uh, the bishop who had been rich, the cardinal. But he, he had the entire court, all the, all the government, move out to the house away from the city. They live in your house. You kind of control them, okay? So you have many rooms to fill them up. A lot of us grew up with this idea of mansions, and we think we're going to go to a big mansion when we get to heaven, and we're going to move way out of town. And uh, once in a while, we'll come to the city, see a baseball game, the angels are playing. And uh, then we'll get home, and we'll, you know, we'll draw up the drawbridge, and we'll fill the moat with alligators, and we'll be all by ourselves. Ah, yeah, I'm in heaven. It's a kind of house all to myself on those rolling hills. That's nonsense. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm telling you the truth. Don't be troubled. Don't be upset. I have a house. God has a house that's so big. He's going to give you your own room. And that to them, that was, wow. Because when you had hospitality and invited someone into your home, that's real love. If you're wealthy like God and say, Phew, you're, you people, I don't really want you here, but here's a, here are a bunch of houses, just stay out of heaven, okay? If you're rich, you can do that, but he says, you come to my house. Back then, that was the highest honor you could pay. And um, so he says, there are many rooms, and it'll be like, remember Home Improvement on TV? Okay, so they'll, he'll, you know, we're away right now, and he's, he's getting this ready, and um, he knows you, and he so, knows what you like. So it's going to be this color, and the bed's going to be like that, and maybe there'll be closed circuit. They'll watch television in heaven. I don't know what they'll watch, but if you don't want to go into L.A. to see the angels play, you can go there. So it's like he's preparing a room for you in his house, despite the fact that you, you, know, you listen to your music too loud. He's going to let you live in his house. Okay, so, so that's important. But now, if you're in John 14, there's this big white space between 14 and the end of 13. And when he says, don't let your heart be troubled, what does he mean? Okay, I'm going to walk around a little bit so I'm not on camera. Hey, what does don't let your heart be troubled mean? Don't stress. What does it mean, DJ? To chill. Thank you. All right? All right, chill. That is a good word. When you have to say to somebody, quit, you know, just chill. What do you, what do you mean? Calm down. So there's a problem. If I say, if I'm from New York, and I say, hey, forget about it, what do I mean? There's, some, there's a reason he's saying that. Okay, do you understand? Jesus says, don't worry about it. Don't let your heart be troubled. Just don't worry about it. Why does he say that? When I came into church today and the lady greeted me, she was so nice, she told me all about this. What if I had said, hey, don't worry about it? She'd have said, what kind of an idiot is coming to preach here, right? Don't worry about it. No, that's not what you say. You don't meet somebody and say nice words. You know, you, when you say don't worry about it, there's a problem, right? Okay, now think. What just happened in chapter 13? Why does Jesus say, don't let your heart be troubled, don't worry about it? We, we say, well, don't worry about what? What just happened? Well, we read in chapter 13, Jesus says, I'm going away, and you can't, you can't, you can't go where I'm coming. 
And one of the guys says, we'll go. We will go. I am going to go with you. Uh, you, can't, you can't go. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go, I'll go with you anywhere. Mm-mm. I'm going to tell you the truth. This Jesus talking to this guy. He says, before this night's over, you're going to three times say, you don't even know me. Are you telling me you're going to follow me everywhere? You can't do it. And that white space, it should be a continuation of John 14. It's like Peter just got put down. He was just a fool. And right in front of everybody, he said, you can't do it. But if you stop reading there and you say, well, there's my devotions for the day. Jesus says we can't do it. You got a problem. But you should go past that because Jesus says, but don't worry about it. Was, was it ever based on your performance that Jesus built a place for you? And we think, occasionally we think it is. Jesus is saying, as humans, you make promises that you can't keep. Ellen White said, our promises are like ropes of sand. Steps to Christ. It's like sand's coming down, I'm trying to climb it. Because I think I will, but I don't really. But Jesus' answer is, don't worry about it. Because I'm building a place for you. And if I build a place for you, I'm coming back to get you. So it's a, it really Jesus is telling us, in spite of our failure to live up to what we wish we could do, is Jesus' faithfulness that we can be happy in. He doesn't leave us with discouragement. He wants us to keep reading. So ignore those white sections sometime, would you? Just read right through it because they're connected. All right, I lied, it's 12.04. <laughs> and they don't have a bell to ring here, Elijah, <laughs> you're stuck. <laughs> All right, so now back to Matthew 11. We've learned about the white spaces, okay? Come to me, all you who are weary, burdened, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, how many of you... Sabbath comes along, you're ready for a rest, right? And so then Jesus comes along, he says, oh, welcome to Sabbath. I'm so glad. Put this on. I got the yoke on. You put a yoke on too. You say, what's this about? You said I was going to get rest. You're putting me to work, <laughs> right? Take my yoke. Oh, you, you want rest? Take my yoke. Put it on you. Now, what in the world is he talking about? Do you know what a yoke is? So if two animals, oxen or cows, are pulling in a field, they're yoked together. Have you ever wondered why they were yoked? Well, you can get twice as much power with two, but there's a special reason why. Because they would take an old, experienced ox, and they would take a new ox, and they'd put them together. Now you're seeing what's happening? So he's, he's saying, come, come on. I'll give you a restful life, but I'll show you how to do it. So he, they put it like a team, you know, and they, they're linked together. And the old ox is just, and the new one's trying to pull on. We got to get going. Get this done fast. Get out of here. I can smell the food. Let's go. Let's get back to the hay. And the old ox says, just wait here. Wait here. And he teaches the young one how to work. How to work. So Jesus doesn't say that every Sabbath is going to be like Disneyland. But he says, I'll show you a different way of living that is not stressful, that's relaxing. He doesn't say, he doesn't say that we'll just sleep on Sabbath. I got a great story about that, but I can't repeat it in church. I'll repeat part of it. A guy was baptized in the church where I started in. I didn't baptize him. The senior pastor did. I was yoked with him. He said, uh, after this evangelistic series, a guy accepted the Sabbath. And he said, I'm, I'm just so happy. He was baptized in first week he didn't come to church and the second week you remember this story Elijah DJ okay I'm glad because uh, you know if you have to hear it twice it's no good didn't come to church a second week and he thought well you know if one week a guy has a family obligation he has to do something be somewhere but two weeks three weeks this guy didn't come to church he says I, I'm not, I, I gotta check on him gotta find out so he called the guy up. He says, you know, I've missed you the last three weeks. Is everything okay in your walk? He says, Pastor, I'm so happy I was baptized. I go to bed on Sabbath. 
and stay through the day, but I got to be honest with you, I'm having a <clears throat> of a time staying in bed. That's not the kind of Sabbath that he's talking about. Jesus actually says, I'll teach you how to live. I'll, you yoke with me. You're just a young guy. I, the master ox, will team up with you, and I'll show you. You just do what I do. Just do what I do. You have a little insight into education today? It's just saying to other people, if, if they don't yet have it mastered, we have to be careful how we ask them, whether they're a student or whether they're 50 or 60 or 62, okay? Just do what I do. And Adventism is a wonderful opportunity because for somebody whose life is kind of chaotic, it's a, it's a blessing because we teach them how to spend their money. You give one-tenth to God. Teach them how to spend their time. You give a seventh to rest for God. We're, so some of our rules are a blessing to people in chaos. Some of them, we forget that the rules aren't the same thing as a mentor. But it, you have a wonderful opportunity as Adventist people to help people put things together. All right? And that's what God gave us for education. And all through Jesus' ministry, he's learning from his father, and he's telling his disciples, who are 12, gathered in his name, that there I am among you. And when he gets ready to leave, he says, well, I got to leave, John 15, but I'm sending someone who's still going to be among you in my name. And whatever he says, it's like me saying it. Who's that? The comforter or counselor or Holy Spirit. Think of yourself as a mentor, not a bossy teacher, not a person who's just saying all the time. Think of being a witness as just someone who has learned how. And people can come along you, uh, alongside you and learn how if they want to and when they want to. All right. Father, we just uh, we make things so complicated. In our, in our schools, we have to learn physics and calculus and English and history and get into a college, and it's all so complicated. Help us to remember that most of life is about, is about rest and about learning how to live easier and loving. I just pray that everybody in here will be able to see one place in their life where they can be a blessing by being a teacher. I ask for that in your name. Amen.